Hey everyone, welcome to part 4 of the Ultimate Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg created by Jimbo Seth. If you are new to the series, I will link parts 1 through 3 for you in the description, so make sure you watch those as well once you complete this video. Now without further ado, let's continue our journey into the Ultimate Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. Meso Blues is the partially found prototype short of the Johnny Bravo Cartoon Network series. At first, the show was supposed to focus on three Elvis impersonators, but due to the time constraints, the creator Van Partible cut the idea down to one Elvis impersonator. The short would be shown to some staff members at Hanna-Barbera Productions, and they would absolutely love it and ask Partible to pitch it as a seven-minute cartoon. The Meso Blues short, as well as Partible's pitch, would eventually develop into the Johnny Bravo character. Partible also wanted to make Johnny Bravo a bit more unique and not strictly tied to a single real-life entity such as Elvis. This would lead to Johnny's design resembling James Dean in appearance while retaining the Elvis-like speech. The only footage that has ever surfaced of Messel Blues are a few short mute clips from a mini documentary that was included as a bonus feature on the Johnny Bravo Season 1 DVD. The short-faced bear was a prehistoric animal that resided in North America about 11,000 years ago. The short-faced bear may be one of the largest known terrestrial mammalian carnivores that has ever existed, and the majority of zoologists believe it to be extinct. However, some theorize that they still exist in North America and Russia. There would be a number of sightings where various examiners would say the body of a supposed short face was much too large and unique to be that of a brown bear, which are some of the largest on Earth. And before we continue, I would like to take a short break and talk about today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. By now, I'm sure you have all heard of the immensely popular dark fantasy RPG, Raid Shadow Legends. With over 600 unique champions to collect, customize, and battle with, there is never a dull moment in the game. Raid has been one of my favorite games to play while I'm working on my videos, and you can download it for free on your PC or mobile device today. One of my favorite factions are the High Elves, having been one of the first civilizations around and assisting in the development of other groups after the fall of the Lizardmen Empire. But their story does not come without any trials and tribulations, as they had to fight and survive the constant onslaught of orc rampages that plagued the continent. Furthermore, the High Elves have experienced the pain of betrayal, having had their own people convert the Kingdom of Aravia to shadow magic, which led to a civil war amongst themselves. Ultimately, the Dark Elves were exiled and Aravia rebuilt themselves to become the brightest, wealthiest, and most powerful country in the realm of Teleria. If you download Raid this month, you can get your hands on some amazing new content. Introducing the brand new faction, the Sylvan Watchers, which if I may add, just look amazing. Moreover, we got a new season of the Forge Pass and a full lineup of fresh events where you can obtain some of the most powerful gear to grace the game. And finally, if you are an Amazon Prime member, you can get yourself some free exclusive rewards right now. There's no better time to begin your journey in Raid than now. And if you click the link in the description or scan the QR code you see on screen, you'll get extra bonuses worth $30. That's a free epic champion, Rector Droth, 200k silver, an energy refill, an XP boost, and one ancient shard which allows you to summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. Again, scan the QR code or click the link in the description to get all these amazing items today for free. Thank you to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Johnny Gosh was a paperboy living with his family in Iowa, and he would go missing in 1982 at the age of 12. It's presumed that he was kidnapped, and as of 2022, there have been no arrests made. On Sunday, September 5th, 1982, Johnny would leave home before dawn to begin his paper route. Typically, Johnny would be accompanied by his father when doing this route, but for whatever reason, he chose to only bring along his dog this morning. Other paper carriers would report seeing Johnny picking up his papers, but little did they know that this would be the last time that they would ever see the boy. A few hours later, Noreen and John, which are Johnny's parents, would begin receiving phone calls from customers complaining that they haven't received their papers yet. And yes, Johnny's father was named John, so whenever I say John, I am referring to the dad. John would venture into the neighborhood in search of his son to find out why he hasn't delivered the papers, but to his surprise, he couldn't find Johnny anywhere. Instead, he was only able to find the wagon that Johnny brought along to carry the papers. John and Noreen would immediately contact police at this point, but according to Noreen, the police acted very slowly with little to no urgency. She estimated that it took almost an hour before the police even showed up to their home. Initially, the police would say that Johnny was a runaway, but would later change that statement and say Johnny was kidnapped. In 1997, Noreen would report that one morning around 2.30am, Johnny would knock on her door accompanied by a mystery man. 
By this time, Johnny would have been 27 years old. Noreen would claim to immediately recognize the 27 year old as Johnny and they would sit down and talk for about an hour and a half, but she wouldn't gain any information on where he was staying or where he would be going once he left. Some critics would say that this account was simply a dream that Noreen had due to the trauma she has suffered after losing Johnny, but despite the naysayers, Noreen would remain steadfast on her accounts. So what exactly happened then? Well, it's almost certain that Johnny was abducted and the strange thing about this case is that other children around Johnny's age have gone missing in the past near the same location. This would lead investigators to believe that the victims were all tied to one or more files that were only interested in children of a certain age range. This particular theory goes quite deep, even bringing up a point in time where Noreen was threatened by anonymous individuals to stop looking for her son. There is a podcast called Faded Out that had a segment on Johnny Gosh. The podcast went on to say that the newspaper business that Johnny worked for had pedophiles within it as well as associates that were known offenders. So from a few sources, I was told to be kind of careful when it comes to this entry. I'm just going to provide you with the facts of the events and you guys can come to your own conclusions. And being that this case does involve a child, some of you may be sensitive to the contents within this entry, so feel free to skip to the timestamp on screen. John Bonet Ramsey was an American child beauty queen who was killed at the age of six in Boulder, Colorado. A handwritten ransom note would be found in the Ramsey home, and of course at this time the family would assume that John Bonet was still safe, so they would decide to contact the police. Less than eight hours after the police arrived, John Bonet's corpse would be found inside the family's home in the basement. On her mouth would be a strip of duct tape as well as a smooth cord wrapped around her neck. Her skull would also be found broken, but the official cause of death would be ruled as asphyxiation. The case garnered worldwide media interest due to the girl's age and fame within the beauty pageant community. The case has gone cold over the years and remains open with the Boulder Police Department. It was also said that the crime scene was heavily compromised before the police could even investigate. The police would later add that they never even bothered to search the Ramsey household as the ransom letter gave them no reason to believe that John Bonet was inside the house. DNA on John Bonet's clothing would be found leading to a single mystery man who was not found when comparing to over 1 million other samples. There is no definitive evidence pointing at any particular suspect, but some internet investigators would say that the note was a fake and was only meant to serve as a red herring. Again, as much as I'd like to continue with this entry, I'll leave the rest for you guys to speculate on. And just like any other topic on this iceberg, if you are interested in learning more about the case, you can click the link in the description which will take you to the iceberg which has every single entry linked. Joseph Merrick aka The Elephant Man was an Englishman known for having severe deformities. Joseph would become famous in London after debuting at a freak show. He would then go on to live at the London Hospital after he met Sir Frederick Treves. Joseph would begin having these abnormal developments around the age of 5 and his mother would pass away when he was 11. Joseph's father and new stepmother would reject him, forcing him to live with his uncle Charles. Charles would contact a showman named Sam Tor and propose that he should exhibit Joseph. Unfortunately, Joseph Merrick's stint in the circus would be short-lived and end with him being robbed and abandoned by his own manager. This would lead to his stay in the London hospital, as well as his friendship with Frederick. While he stayed at the hospital, Joseph would also be visited by wealthy ladies and gentlemen who were curious about his condition. Joseph Merrick would die in April of 1890 and the official cause of death would be labeled as asphyxiation. But Frederick, who performed the autopsy, would say Joseph died of a dislocated neck. It's unclear what the exact cause of Joseph's deformities are, but some professionals believe he had Proteus syndrome which is a rare disorder that can cause tissue overgrowth. Only about 200 cases of this condition have been confirmed worldwide, and Joseph's hair and bones would be tested in 2003, but due to the heavy bleaching of his skeleton, the study was inconclusive. The Kaz-2 aka the Ghost Yacht is a catamaran which was found drifting off the northeastern coast of Australia in 2007. The Kaz-2 had a crew of three men who were all relatively inexperienced sailors, Derek Baden, Peter Tunstead, and James Tunstead. They departed from Airlie Beach on April 15th, 2007 in a journey that would take the trio around Northern Australia to Western Australia. The first indication that something had gone awry would be a helicopter that reported spotting the Kaz-2 adrift with the crew potentially in distress. Two days later, maritime authorities would catch up to the boat and board it. 
They would find that all three men had gone missing, and more or less everything about the boat appeared normal. It's just that there was no sign of the crew. Food and silverware were set out on the table, a laptop was turned on, and the engine was still running. Officials would also confirm that the boat's emergency systems, including the radio and GPS, were also fully functional. All the life jackets were also accounted for, and aside from the crew being missing, the only strange characteristic of the boat would be the torn sails. After analyzing the data in the ship's GPS system, police would find that the ship was shown to be adrift late in the afternoon on the same day that the crew departed. The police also recovered a video recording taken by the trio during the trip around 10 a.m. The video would show the following details. One of the crew members was seen fishing, a long white rope was trailing behind the boat, the engine was off, the sea was choppy, and the location of various items were not the same as authorities had found them. The state coroner would say in his official report that he cannot give a definitive answer as to how the crew died, but based on the evidence found and eyewitness reports, he would give the following scenario. On April 15, 2007, the CAS-2 was sailing in the vicinity of George Point, and at first, the trip was going as planned. However, the situation would go through a dramatic change. One of the men who was fishing had his lure caught on the rudder, and when one of the friends went to free the lure, he accidentally fell overboard. Derek Batten would stay on the ship while the second Tunstead brother would also dive into the water to save the other. By this time, the seas have become pretty choppy and violent, making it nearly impossible for the brothers to climb back aboard the boat. Derek, having started the motor, would realize that he needed to drop the sails before he could go back for his friends. As Derek left the helm to drop the sails, the wind would cause the boom, which is that horizontal bar near the bottom of the sail, to swing into Derek, sending him into the water as well. Within seconds, the boat would be out of reach of Derek, and of course, you can probably guess what happened to the trio, as none of them were very good swimmers, and the seas have become increasingly violent at this point. Some internet investigators would say that this account is completely wrong, and that the events are, for a lack of a better word, dumb. But I think what we need to keep in mind here is that when you're out at sea all alone and one bad thing happens, it's very easy for your adrenaline to take over and lead you to making numerous poor choices in a very short amount of time. If this sequence of events was even remotely close to what really happened, then diving into the sea without proper training is beyond moronic and instead the two remaining on the ship should have thrown whatever lifecraft they had on board. But regardless, what truly happened on the cast 2 still remains a mystery. Kenny Veach was a 47-year-old Las Vegas resident that went missing in the Mojave Desert in November of 2014. Kenny was an avid hiker and frequented the hiking community on YouTube, commenting on almost every video he came across. And one day he would leave this comment on a video titled, Son of an Area 51 Technician. This ain't nothing, I am a long distance hiker. One time, during one of my hikes out by the Nellis Air Force Base, I found a hidden cave. The entrance to the cave was shaped like a perfect capital M. I always enter every cave I find, but as I began to enter this particular cave, my whole body began to vibrate. The closer I got to the cave entrance, the worse the vibrating became. Suddenly, I became very scared and hightailed it out of there. That was one of the strangest things that ever happened to me. This comment would of course spark the curiosity of many. Several users of the site would urge Kenny to seek out the cave again and explore it, but to document the journey this time. Kenny would accept this challenge and set off to find the mysterious cave a second time. However, this time he would bring along a 9mm handgun as well. Unfortunately, he could not find the cave and no clues could be found in the video that Kenny uploaded of his hike. This failure to locate the cave would lead to criticisms provoking Kenny to go out and search for the cave for a third time. Again, Kenny would accept. Although there was one comment that was left on this video that read, No, do not go back there. If you find that cave entrance, don't go in. If you do, you won't get out. It's on this third hike in November of 2014 where Kenny would not return, which was beyond strange as, again, Kenny was an avid hiker, having solo hiked for over 20 years across mountaintops that he claims most people wouldn't dare go. Eventually, news stations would pick up on this story and the search was on. Kenny's cell phone would be found, but unfortunately, the trail would go cold afterwards. So what was Kenny's fate then? Did Kenny fall down a mine shaft? Did he get lost and die from dehydration? Or did he stumble across a secret military base of some sort? Remember, Kenny did live in Nevada, and for all of my alien enthusiasts, this is supposedly where Area 51 is, leading some to think that Kenny stuck his nose where he shouldn't have. 
Another popular theory is that Kenny may have taken his own life, but based on his liveliness in his videos and comments, many investigators do not believe this to be true. Kenny's supposed girlfriend would eventually come out and make a comment, but even she doesn't really have any idea what really happened to Kenny. I will try not to spend too much time on this topic as you all know about the idea of there being a god. The existence of God has been debated for thousands of years and depending on your religion, this God being would appear differently but they are more or less all looked to as the creator of everything. Now I am going to oversimplify this but those that believe in God will typically refer to various phenomena that can't be explained using science as proof that God exists. Again that is oversimplified, there are various arguments that those that believe in God will use to prove that he exists. While those that oppose the existence of God tend to lean into reasoning such as religious texts having numerous contradictions or they would point to God and say that there shouldn't be any suffering or pain in the world if such an omnibenevolent being did exist. Most scientists don't care for proving or disproving the existence of God since such a task is nearly impossible. There is no experiment in the world that can ever detect such a being. The Jack family consisted of four people who went missing in August of 1989. Doreen and Ronald aka Ronnie who were 26 when they went missing, Russell who was 9, and then Ryan who was 4. On August 1st 1989, Ronald Jack would leave the First Leader pub in Prince George, British Columbia with a spark in his eyes after being offered a job opportunity that had the potential to change the trajectory of his family's lives. Up until now, Ronnie had been out of work due to a back injury and the Jack family was forced to live on welfare. This mystery man would offer Ronnie and his wife jobs at a logging camp. Ronnie would be responsible for bucking logs and his wife was assigned a spot as the cook's helper in the camp kitchen. Additionally, the camp had a daycare for the family's two young sons, Russell and Ryan. Already, this may sound a bit too good to be true for a family that was really struggling to get on their feet. Well, you would be right for thinking so. On top of all of this, the man offered to drive the jacks to and from the camp since they did not own a vehicle. Ronnie would call his brother and his parents around midnight to tell them about the camp job and that Ronnie, his wife, and the kids would be gone for about 14 days or so. Around 1am on August 2nd, the four members of the family would be seen leaving their home and stepping into the mystery man's dark colored pickup truck. It was at this point where they would never be seen again. It wouldn't be until August 25th where the family would be reported missing and for almost 7 years, the police would not have any hints as to what happened to the family. On January 28th, 1996, at around 8.30 a.m., a man in Stony Creek called the Vanderhoof police with a short message. The Jack family are buried in the south end of X Ranch. Now, the caller didn't actually say X Ranch. They did give the name, but it was too difficult to understand, and so the police were not able to find the bodies. Investigators would publish numerous appeals in newspapers begging for this mystery person to call once more, but no luck. Eventually, the police would be able to trace the phone call to a house in Vanderhoof, but that didn't lead to the culprit being identified. Over the years, the RCMP would interview hundreds of people, go through thousands of documents related to the case and comb several properties in search of the Jack family, but each attempt has failed. The most recent search actually happened in 2019. Two people who supposedly have seen the mystery man would give details to the police and they have come up with the following sketches. He was described as a white male, 6 to 6 foot 6 in height, with reddish brown hair, as well as a full beard and mustache. He was estimated to be 35 to 40 years old in 1989, which would mean he is now in his late 60s or 70s if he is still alive. Additionally, he looked like he weighed 200 to 275 pounds, and on the night he was seen, he was wearing a baseball cap, red checker shirt, faded blue jeans, and work boots. It's now been over three decades since the Jack family disappeared, and we have no further leads as to who killed the Jack family, but it is possible that they are still alive, we really do not know.
Mirror matter is a hypothetical counterpart to ordinary matter. Modern physics involves three basic types of spatial symmetry. There is reflection, rotation, and translation. And I'm not going to BS you guys with a bunch of technical jargon here because even after reading over this topic multiple times, I'm still somewhat lost as to what the significance is. But basically, mirror matter is capable of balancing out the fact that ordinary matter tends to have left hand bias with its interactions, which means Means it can restore parity. Now what is parity you may ask? In layman's terms it's the reflection of coordinates from particles from their origin and that's about the extent of what I understood about this topic. There is a worldwide phenomenon where people would report hearing loud booms that rattle entire neighborhoods, such as the Seneca Guns incident. These loud booms seem to come out of nowhere and scientists have a tough time explaining why they happen, but there are a few theories, such as large waves and of course tsunamis crashing into cliffs which are capable of creating large bangs. Some people also say that the booms are a result of army jets going past the speed of sound. Then there are earthquakes, sand dunes, and other man-made origins such as gas explosions. Green Boots is the name assigned to an unidentified body of a climber inside a limestone cave on Mount Everest. I did say that this body is unidentified, but the majority of people believe that this is the body of this man here. I'm not even going to attempt the name, I'm sure I'm going to destroy it. The man was an Indian climber said to have died on the mountain in 1996 and obviously the name he was given was inspired by the bright green boots he was wearing. Pretty much every journey on Mount Everest on the north side would encounter the body, but in 2014 the body would be moved. Now I couldn't find out if this body was moved off of the mountain by officials or moved elsewhere on top of Mount Everest, but I'm assuming it's the latter. Reason being is that the terrain of these mountains are extremely tough to traverse in the locations of these bodies, making it nearly impossible to retrieve them. In addition to the tough terrain, weather conditions and the lack of oxygen also make the journeys tough to justify, and even if a crew were able to reach the body, they are usually frozen in place. As I said earlier, this body is believed to belong to this man who was traversing the mountain with his team of five other climbers. It's believed that the Everest disaster of 1996 is what led to this man's death, as they were caught in a massive blizzard. Three of the six total climbers would decide to continue for the summit despite the blizzard while the rest stayed behind. This blizzard would claim the lives of eight total climbers on the mountain and go down as the third deadliest season on Mount Everest. Now, some of you may have just come to a realization. The group that continued to the summit consisted of three total people, so it's possible that the Green Boots body was one of the other two men. The man of the hole was an indigenous person who lived alone in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil and is believed to be the sole inhabitants of a protected indigenous territory that was demarcated by the Brazilian government in 2007. And the man of the hole's tale is a pretty sad one. The man of the hole's people were all killed in a genocide by Brazilian settlers earlier in time. After this event, he would choose to remain isolated until his death in 2022, but he would leave the world with something strange. In each of his former homes, he would leave behind a deep hole with an unknown purpose which is what gave him the nickname Man of the Hole. The Long Island serial killer aka the Craigslist Ripper is an unidentified serial killer who is believed to have taken the lives of 10 to 16 people over a period of nearly two decades. Most of the victims were S workers and their bodies would be disposed of on the south shore of Long Island, New York. A woman named Shannon Gilbert would disappear, causing the police to search the area around beach towns Gilgo and Oak Beach. In 2010 near the Gilgo Beach, the remains of four victims would be found within a quarter mile of each other. The four victims are Melissa Bartholomew, Maureen Bernard Barnes, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. This group of four would be labeled as the Gilgo Four by media outlets and all died by strangulation. In March of 2011, another six sets of remains would be found in the Suffolk County and police believe that these six were murdered before the Gilgo Four. 
Shannon Gilbert's body would be found in December of 2011, about 19 months after her disappearance. Her cause of death is still contested to this day, with police arguing that she died by drowning and is not tied to the Long Island killer, while an individual autopsy determined she passed by strangulation. On September of 2017, the Suffolk County prosecutor announced that a carpenter from Long Island named John Bitrolf was a suspect in at least one of the murders. What brought this on was John's conviction in May of the same year, where he was found to be responsible of the murders of two S workers in 1993 and 1994. Furthermore, John lived close to where some body parts in the case had been found, but to this day, all of the murders remain unsolved. There would be a relatively large number of other suspects brought to light, but none of them would lead to any significant investigations. One of these suspects was actually a former Suffolk County Police Chief, James Burke, who was rumored to have had relations with the local S-workers in the past. Jim Gray was a computer scientist born in San Francisco who received a Turing Award in 1998. At first, Jim was wanting to join the Air Force, but after being turned down from the academy, he entered the University of California in 1961. Jim was discouraged by his chemistry grades and would leave Berkeley for six months before returning. He would eventually graduate in 1966 with a bachelor's degree in engineering mathematics. Jim Gray was an avid and experienced sailor, but on January 28, 2007, he would fail to return from a short solo trip near San Francisco where he would scatter his mother's ashes. The weather was clear that day and Jim didn't even send out a distress call. Coast guards would utilize planes, helicopters, and boats in their search for Jim Gray. But after four days, they would find nothing. At the time, Jim was working for Microsoft and was a beloved figure in his field, which led to the formation of the Jim Gray Group, which was made to study clues that were obtained by the Digital Globe satellite. And I want to make an emphasis on just how beloved Jim was. Juggernauts such as IBM, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google all came together and provided resources and funding in an attempt to locate and hopefully save Jim. But unfortunately, their efforts wouldn't yield the desired results. There would also be an underwater search using highly sophisticated equipment, but that also did not lead anywhere and would come to an end on May 31st of the same year. So now let us discuss what may have happened to Jim. The first of which is Jim taking his own life. Some people believe that Jim just had enough of life. Not in a depressing sense though, but rather he felt that he had seen and done everything he had desired and felt no reason to continue. Another theory is that he was hit by rogue waves. Jim's yacht may have been overwhelmed by nature and ultimately he was knocked overboard, causing him to drown to death. And now for the more outlandish theory, which oddly enough is probably the one that most people agree on. About three months after Jim was declared legally dead, a Reddit user would use a throwaway account under the name Tom Gold Account, where they would say the following, I cut off all contact with everyone I know and moved to Kenya. I tell people a fake name and a fake background and have made it appear to my family that I died on a boat trip in the Pacific. No, I am not joking, I am dead in the United States. Obviously, this is definitely a reach. There's no way for us to know if this is actually someone who disappeared, let alone Jim Gray. And communities around almost anyone who died or went missing can point to this post as that person. And as I said earlier, this was posted under a throwaway account 10 years ago, so unfortunately, there's no room to dig further into it. The Green Children of Woolpit is a legend revolving around two children in England who supposedly had an unusual skin color. Sometime in the 12th century, this brother-sister duo would be discovered speaking an unknown language and having a strange diet of eating strictly raw beans. And of course, by the name, their skin would appear green. The children would be taught to adjust their diet and eventually they would lose their green color. However, the boy would become ill and die while the sister was able to adjust to her new life. When the girl learned to speak English, she explained that she and her brother came from a land where the sun never shone. According to some people, she called this place St. Martin's Land. Did these green children actually exist? Well, some people believe so, while others are understandably skeptical. Most people are dead set that this was all a folktale retelling an imaginary encounter with beings from another world. But those that believe the story don't believe it in the manner it was told. Instead, they think that the story, while foundationally accurate, has been skewed in a manner where it now resembles a fairy tale more than anything else.
In Australia on June 9, 1979, a fire would break out inside Luna Park on the ride known as the Ghost Train. Due to the combination of understaffing and inadequate firefighting measures, the fire would completely consume the ride, which resulted in the deaths of seven people. The accident would originally be blamed on electrical faults, but arson would also later be acclaimed. A woman named Jenny Godson, who is the wife of one of the victims, came across some of the photographs taken during the day of the accident, and one of them would stand out to her. A picture of her her son Damien, who also lost his life that day, standing next to a large figure wearing a demonic mask with horns. And as you may have guessed, they were unable to locate this mystery man and some people would compare this unidentified man to the god Moloch who is believed to adore sacrifices that involve the burning of children. Jenny would then believe that this accident was all a result of some sinister group. But to this day, both the cause of the accident and the identity of this demon man remain a mystery. The Martin family resided in Portland, Oregon and disappeared on December 7, 1958 near the Columbia River Gorge during a shopping trip. The missing family members included a husband slash father named Kenneth, the wife slash mother Barbara, and the couple's three daughters, Barbara who was often referred to as Barbie instead, Virginia, and Susan aged 14, 13, and 11 respectively. However, Kenneth and Barbara also had a son who was a part of the Navy, but at the time of the family's disappearance, he was stationed in New York. A few months after the family had vanished, the bodies of Virginia and Susan would be found downstream on the shores of the Columbia River. Police would initially think that the family's car had crashed into the river, but would later drop this idea when they couldn't come up with adequate circumstances to support the idea. The whereabouts of Kenneth, Barbara, and Barbie remain unknown and their vehicle has yet to be discovered. The accounts of where the Martins were during their shopping trip are a bit sparse, but a gas station proprietor would report that he came across them when they purchased 5 gallons of gas from his store, which was approximately 40 miles away from their home in Portland. Another 20 miles east, the family would be sighted once again by a snack bar waitress who served the family. The family would then be officially reported as missing on December 9th after Kenneth failed to report to his job and the girls not showing up for school. Now, the cause of death for Susan and Virginia aren't exactly clear. One of the technicians who took the fingerprints of the girls prior to the autopsies noted that there were holes in the girls' heads that looked like bullet holes, but the medical examiner's reports would not mention such an injury and would instead declare the cause of death for both girls to be drowning. Another interesting clue I'd like to add is what was found on Susan's clothing. On Susan's t-shirt, there would be traces of metal that included aluminum and, funny enough, the location where police suspect the family's car to have met the river is not far from an aluminum smelting plant. One theory behind this case is that Kenneth crashed the vehicle into the river intentionally, but there are also theories revolving around the family being abducted and forced off of a cliffside that ultimately led them into the river. In 1961, three years after the family's disappearance, an anonymous resident wrote a letter to the Oregon Journal stating that they were parked next to a vehicle that was headed under the railroad tracks that would lead towards the river. And of course, they would say the vehicle resembled that of the Martin families. Moments later, they would hear screams coming from the direction that the vehicle went towards, but when they went to investigate, they found nothing. As of 2022, the other three family members as well as the vehicle have not been found. Henry Hudson was an English navigator from the 17th century. Hudson is most famous for his explorations of present-day Canada and parts of northeastern the United States. But on an expedition that took place between 1610 and 1611, Hudson's crew would rebel against him. The British East India Company and the Virginia Company would provide funding for one of Hudson's voyages in 1610. In August, Hudson and his crew would be ecstatic believing that they have finally found an ice-free Northwest Passage to Asia. In addition to being free of obstacles, the passage was believed to be considerably shorter, making for more efficient trips. Hudson would spend the following months mapping and exploring the shores, but he and his crew would realize that they in fact did not find such a passage. Shortly after this realization, their ship would become trapped in ice in James Bay. The ice would clear in the spring of 1611 and Hudson planned to continue exploring to discover the passage, but by this point, Hudson's crew had become tired and irritated and just wanted to go home. This would lead to a mutiny and Hudson along with seven others would be kicked off the ship, left sailing adrift on a small shallop. 
Hudson and his seven men would attempt to keep up with the ship, but they would eventually be left behind. And as many of you may presume, they would soon be lost and never seen again. One of the crew members named Prickett would keep a journal on the state of Hudson after he was kicked off the ship, but many people would criticize his journal for being biased. There really aren't many theories as to the specifics of what Hudson and the men did once they were separated, but it's safe to assume they likely died of starvation. Okay, so this entry is pretty funny, or at least in my opinion, compared to all the other depressing topics on this iceberg. But anyways, Him is a 1974 adult film that focuses on a man's erotic obsession with Jesus Christ. The film first obtained mainstream attention in 1980 when it was featured in the book titled The Golden Turkey Awards, where it won the award for being the most unerotic concept in adult films. However, it would soon be brought up that the film didn't exist, which would make it fake of course, but this would later be debunked as the fake film in question was actually called Dog of Norway. Parts of the Him film have surfaced over the years, including some online reviews of it, but obviously since this is on the iceberg, the complete film has never been found, but we do know it does exist as the actor portraying Jesus Christ did confirm that he was in the film. Which might sound kind of dumb if you just hear that for the first time, but for a while the actor couldn't be found so people thought it was just a photo shoot and not actually a film. The I-70 Killer is an unidentified American serial killer who killed six store clerks in the spring of 1992. And as you probably expected, the name was inspired from the fact that most of the victims worked in stores near Interstate 70. His victims were typically young, petite, brunette women, but they were not limited to just females. Along with those murdered, the I-70 killer is suspected of shooting three additional store clerks in Texas between 1993 and 1994. The 1992 killing spree began on April 8th with the death of 26-year-old Robin Foldauer in Indianapolis, Indiana. Robin was the manager of a Payless shoe source and was alone in the store when she was shot and murdered at around 1.30pm. Her body would be discovered by police in the back of the store around 3pm, and the culprit would leave with less than $100 from the cash register. The following two murders occurred on April 11th at a bridal shop in Wichita, Kansas, which is about a 2-3 to three hour drive from Indiana where he took the life of his first victim. The two victims in Kansas were Patricia Smith, who was 23 years old, and then 32-year-old Patricia Majors. This would be the only time that the killer took out multiple people in a single location, making police believe that he thought only one woman was in the store at the time. The woman would keep the store open past the normal closing time of 6pm since they were expecting a male customer to pick up an item. Not long after 6pm, the woman would let in a man who they thought was the customer but instead was actually the I-70 killer. After the two were murdered, the real customer would arrive and come face to face with the killer. The mysterious killer would ask the customer to go to the back of the room with him, but obviously the guy would refuse. The I-70 killer then would tell him to leave the scene. Being terrified, this man wouldn't report the incident until an hour after it had actually happened. He would provide the police with details for a composite sketch where he described the killer as being a slender white man with reddish hair armed with an Uzi style gun. And we only went over the cases of three of the victims, but every single person was shot in the back of the head and none of the women showed any signs of being SA'd. All of the stores would be robbed, but it didn't seem like money was the main motive in these killings as they were all small specialty stores that wouldn't carry very much cash. Furthermore, all of these murders would use the same ammunition, causing police to think that the murder weapon was an Intratech Tech 22 or a similar semi-automatic pistol. The closest suspect we've ever had to the I-70 killer is actually the I-65 killer, whose name is Harry Greenwell. While the I-70 killer selected small strip malls along the highway to attack, the I-65 killer chose hotels. Harry Greenwell would also choose to only kill women, but unlike the I-70 killer, he would actually his victims. Most authorities would disagree that these two people are the same due to Greenwell SAing his victims in addition to the fact that he was much more motivated by money unlike the I-70 killer. Furthermore, police believe their killer to be much younger than Greenwell who at the time of the killings would have been around 47 years old. The composite sketches are indeed similar to Greenwell's appearance but nevertheless, police don't believe he is the I-70 killer and are still working on the case non-stop to find the true culprit.
black holes are well holes in space where the strength of gravity is so immense that nothing not even light can escape but what happens when you go through one of these black holes or rather what's inside of it we aren't entirely sure but they are believed to contain an excessive amount of matter and one comparison says to think of a black hole as a star that is 10 times as massive as our sun but squeezed into a sphere that is approximately the diameter of new york city and is it possible for a human to even pass through one? Theoretically, yes, but it's not likely you will survive the trip into the large black hole. Additionally, it is said that when coming close to a black hole, time will slow drastically. From the point of view of an observer, someone falling into the hole would appear frozen in time at the edge. All that being said, it's probably easy to assume that we don't know what lies inside a black hole, but we can still theorize. Most scientists believe that inside we will only find a very dense amalgamation of mass and energy, and aside from what has passed through, it's only space inside. Okay, so this is going to be the last entry for this part of this iceberg. So if you hate spiders, feel free to click off of the video. I have no idea how you actually pronounce the entire name. So I'm just going to call this Fofi. Fofi is a cryptid that is described as being a large spider with a lifespan of about four to six feet and resembles a tarantula. The first reported sighting was in the 1890s near a lake in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. A group of British missionaries were venturing near a lake when they became entangled in an enormous web and two giant spiders four feet in length came out of their web. One member of the group was reportedly bitten and had died shortly after. Many natives described the spiders as being numerous in the past but are now a vanishing species. Civilization gradually converting the natural habitats has driven the spiders to near extinction, or so they say. Alright, so if you guys have made it this far, thank you so much for your time. This is going to end part four and sometime next week I will have part five of this iceberg out. And then around part six is when we should be finished with layer one and then we can finally move on to layer two. So if you enjoyed, leaving a like would really help me out. And if you're brand new and enjoyed the video, feel free to check out one of the ones on the right and make sure to subscribe for all the future content.